you would like to follow along in the reading of the Word of God this morning, if you would turn to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra and Nehemiah come just before Job, which is just before Psalm, book of Psalms. It's a book that you don't turn to very often. But um, this is a part of the historical writings, and it has to do, of course, with the return to the land from which the uh, Jews were exiled in order to prepare for the coming of Christ. And it takes place uh, with the overthrow of Babylon and with the uh, kingdom of Persia now gaining ascendancy. When that takes place, the, the king of Persia, in this case Cyrus, issues a decree to allow the Jews to return to rebuild the temple. And this is the beginning of the return. So let me read this for you in Ezra chapter 1. This is what we read, um, again given to us by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord <clears throat> stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a freewill offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of fathers' households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, and everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, or even everyone. And all those about them encouraged them with articles of silver, with gold, with goods, with cattle, and with valuables, aside from all that was given them, uh, that was given as a freewill offering. Also King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and put in the house of his gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought out by the hand of, of Mithridath, the treasurer, and he counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. Now this was their number, 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 410 silver bowls of a second kind, and a thousand other articles. All the articles of gold and silver numbered 5,400. Shesh Bazar brought them all up with the exiles who went up from Babylon to Jerusalem. Uh, so ends the reading of God's word. May he uh, bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now remember last week we saw a, a picture and a prophecy regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, how the Lord appeared in the fiery furnace in order to save his children as a picture of what he would soon be coming to do on the cross. He also sent Gabriel to tell Daniel when it was he was actually going to do this. In 70 weeks, as we understand, 70 weeks of years, or 490 years from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. In revealing these things, the Lord really had two audiences in mind. Certainly the people who were then living in the exile. He wanted to give them hope by showing them that notwithstanding the circumstances they were in, that he was still sovereign and that his intention to send the Messiah into the world had not changed. The Lord was near. He also wanted to remind them what the Messiah was going to do when he finally arrived. He was going to save them from the fiery furnace of his wrath. But let's not forget that there was another audience in his mind as well. Not only those believers who lived at that time, as well as those among his people that weren't believers, but also those who would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in the ages to come. In other words, us, to also give us hope. The hope that comes from knowing that the Bible is in fact the Word of God. When we see these things actually coming to pass, again, it assures us that the one who said these things is God. He's the only one who can tell us the future. And this gives us the hope that the Word of God is true. 
that we have not believed in vain and that when the end comes, that is the end of our lives, we will be glad that we have trusted and followed the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes these things don't really seem to matter to us until it comes time when its truth is the most important to us, and that is when we're dying. But we need to see the truth of it now. We need to understand it now so it will affect our lives in the right way now. Well, again, this shows us that there is hope in the Scriptures. There is a future. There is a heaven that we ought to be aspiring to. But the Lord also wanted to show us that He would not leave us alone in the troubles that we would have to face in this life, that He would be with us, even as He was with the three men in the fiery furnace. The Lord not only knows what we're going through, He has actually planned that we would go through the things that we do. And having planned these things, that He would be with us through our trials and that He would work them all together for our good. God is with us. The Lord Jesus is with us. And of course, he also wanted us to know that he would deliver us from the fiery furnace of God's wrath if we will only put our trust in him. There is a real hell that is ahead for those that will not repent and turn to Christ or who have not to this point done so. The Lord Jesus Christ is able and he is willing to deliver if you will only put your trust in him. Now, the exile and the return, as you'll recall, is the last period, really, in Jewish history before the coming of Christ, and it is a time in which the Lord is preparing for His coming. This morning, we see another very large step forward in the, uh, the, the progress, as it were, of God's plan to bring His Son into the world, and we see it in the overthrow of Babylon and the return to the land of promise. Now, as we consider these things, again, let's be reminded of one very important thing, and that is that God is the one who is in control. And I think we see that. By overturning one kingdom, he sets up another sequence of kings, as it were, all who are inclined to help the Jews return into the land and rebuild the temple and their city. I mean, what more could you ask for? A heathen king, an enemy of God's people, as it were, actually becomes a servant of the Lord to help promote the work of redemption. The hearts of all men are in the hands of the king, the king of the universe. Now the first thing we see this morning is the overthrow of Babylon. Remember that Babylon was originally built in order to stand against God. Those who were building it were those who lived after the flood, those who were the descendants of uh, Noah and his family, that should have migrated out of the area to uh, repopulate the earth to fill the earth again after the flood. But they didn't want to do that. They resisted God's plan. They agreed to together to build a tower that would keep them united as a people, united in strength and united against God. But the Lord overthrew their plans by dividing their languages. Remember at the Tower of Babel. This divided their strength and it forced the people basically to migrate or to relocate into other areas. Uh, through this event, the Lord effectively set the clock of a worldwide rebellion and the day of the Lord back so that he could save his church and continue to do the work of redemption at the same time. Babel was the name of the city that they built, the name of the tower and the city. And this is the same city that later became known as Babylon. Well, just as the Lord advanced his work in those days by dividing their languages and overthrowing their plans, as it were, to rebel against him, he advances his work again by overthrowing Babylon a second time. After Nebuchadnezzar uh, died, or actually I think during a time perhaps when he was still alive, but his son became uh, co-ruler with him, Belshazzar, uh, there was a night in which Belshazzar had a feast. And on that night offended God by misusing the holy vessels that had been taken from his temple in basically a drunken party. It was on that night that Persia conquered Babylon and killed Belshazzar just as the Lord had written on the wall. You remember while Belshazzar and his, feast, or his guests were feasting, this hand appears from nowhere and begins to write on the wall. And what it says is this. Now this is the inscription that was written out. 
Mene, Mene, Tekel Ufarsin, and this is the interpretation of the message. Mene, which is the word that we get the word mina from, means basically it's a unit of measurement. God has numbered your kingdom and put it to an end. In other words, um, basically um, you have been found wanting. Tekel, or tekel, which means to weigh. You have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. And uh, peres, which is basically the word it's in, in Hebrew when you have words put together, additional letters are added to them. That's why in one case you have ufarsin, and in this word you have peres, means to break in two. Your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians. In other words, the handwriting on the wall basically said that God was overthrowing Babylon that night. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what God did when they were conquered by the Persians. God poured out his vengeance upon Babylon for what they did to his people, but at the same time, he was advancing the work of his kingdom one large step forward because of what he was going to do through the ruler of Persia. So first of all, the Lord overthrows Babylon in order to open the door to the Persian Empire. And with the Persian Empire, secondly, now firmly in control, the Lord moves upon the hearts of the Persian kings to issue several decrees that allow the Jews to return to the land to rebuild their temple and their city, preparing the way for the Messiah. And of course, also as a picture of Christ coming to build his temple. By the way, as you're reading through the Old Testament, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but you run into the name Darius quite a bit. You run into the name Artaxerxes quite a bit. And if you're not aware of it, there were several kings who were named Darius. There were several kings who were named Artaxerxes. And you wonder, how, what a coincidence. How could there be so many people with the same name? Well, the reason is because the word Darius and the word Artaxerxes are not the names of the kings, but really titles for the kings. And so that's, that can perhaps alleviate some confusion. But I want you to notice from our text this morning that as soon as Cyrus was firmly in control, he passed a decree that allowed the Jews to return to their own land to rebuild their city and their temple. I don't know if I need to, re to really read this to you again. I think it came out fairly clearly. But I do want you to notice the decree to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, or actually the temple in this case but also the command to, um, to give them the provisions that they needed everywhere to make it possible. In verse 4, Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a freewill offering for the house of God which is in Jerusalem. Now it would be one thing for the king say, to say, okay, uh, go ahead and go and build your city, but I'm not going to give you anything to do it with. Well, that's not the kind of decree that the Lord actually moved upon the heart of Cyrus to give, but rather it was one that allowed them to go back and made provision for them to do this work. Now, next to the Lord's bringing his people out of Egypt, the return is perhaps the greatest picture of redemption that we have in the Old Testament. Because basically, we have almost identic the identical situation. People of God in bondage in Egypt the Lord brings them out by Moses and Aaron. The people in bondage in Babylon, now taken over by Persia, he leads them out by Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. In this case, it was led by Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, who is actually one of Christ's ancestors. Uh, Zechariah and Haggai are both prophets who prophesied during the return. And Haggai was the one who prophesied that the Lord Jesus would actually come from the line of Zerubbabel in chapter 2, verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, declares the Lord. And I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. If you care to take the time to do it, if you turn to Matthew's Gospel and you look at the first chapter of the genealogy, you'll find that Zerubbabel is in fact one of Christ's descendants. He was the one who led the Jews back into the land together with Joshua, the, the, uh, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and who together rebuilt the temple. Now, as I've said, this is as much a picture of the Lord's redemption as his leading his people out of Egypt to the promised land 
through Moses. Moses was also a picture of Christ, accompanied with Aaron, who was the first high priest. They led God's people out of Egypt and brought them to Canaan. Now Moses was not in the lineage of the Messiah, but he certainly was a type of the Messiah. God will raise up, Moses said, a prophet like me, you will listen to him. In this case, we have a descendant of Christ, Zerubbabel, along with the high priest at that time, whose name is Joshua. By the way, this is not the Joshua who brought them into the Promised Land originally uh, under the conquest. There were several people who were named Joshua. But I do want to remind you of what the name Joshua actually means. The Lord is salvation. And remember that Joshua himself was also a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as we saw in our meditation. That he was the branch, as it were, and he was going to be the one who was going to rebuild the temple of God. Well, here we have Zerubbabel and Joshua going back to the land to rebuild the temple, but that, of course, was simply a picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ was going to do to build the true temple of God. In both cases, the Lord granted to Moses and Aaron, to the people of Israel, to Zerubbabel and Joshua, uh, articles of gold and silver so that they would have the materials that they needed to complete the work. Both of these were really pictures of what Christ would do for us through his life and through his death. He would lead us from our bondage to the world, to heaven. He would make us, as it were, members of his temple. He would build his temple. Now this decree of Cyrus was really only the first. The, the work continued by God's grace under several uh, successive Persian kings. And here's where we get into the Darius's and the Artaxerxes. It continued first of all under Darius. When the enemies of God's people, the surrounding nations came against the Jews for re, you know, rebuilding the temple, uh, tried to stop them, uh, the Lord began to encourage them in various ways. And by the way, the one group of people in particular that stands out, that tried to stop God's people from doing this, uh, were the Samaritans. And uh, the Samaritans, as I mentioned uh, at some point, I forget whether it was this morning now in the service or whether it was in the Sunday school, are really uh, half Jew and half Gentiles. And they, they, they were the ones that basically repopulated Samaria, which was just north of Judea. And remember, Jerusalem is in Judea. And they were the ones who stood against the Jews because uh, they believed they had the true worship of God. And first of all, they, they say, let us build the temple with you. And then they say, no, you have nothing to do with us. You have nothing to do with the worship of God. You may not participate with us. And uh, after they said that, of course, then they became their enemies and tried to stop them. But as they tried to stop them, first of all, the prophets of God, Haggai and Zechariah, began to minister to them, to encourage them to arise again and rebuild the temple. Well, then the enemies of God send a letter to Darius and they say, your enemies are building the city which stood against you. You need to do something to stop it. Well, through that, the Lord actually promoted the work. Uh, through a decree issued by King Darius, it not only warned the enemies to leave them alone, so that they could complete the work, but he also ordered them to provide whatever the Jews needed to complete the work. And if they did not do that, then he says, let a timber be taken out of your house and for you to be impaled upon it. In other words, under the threat of death, you must help the Jews rebuild their temple. He also ordered further that gold and silver utensils that Nebuchadnezzar had originally taken from the temple be returned to them as well. Now under Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes commissioned Ezra, as we find later in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, uh, commissioned Ezra to return to the land and ordered that he be provided with whatever he needed to complete this work. Ezra chapter 7, verses 21 through 23. I, even I, King Artaxerxes, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the provinces beyond the river that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven may require of you, it shall be done diligently. Even up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil, and salt as needed. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal for the house of the God of heaven, so that there will not be wrath against the kingdom of the king and his sons. Now this decree by Artaxerxes was perhaps the most generous decree that had been issued on behalf of the Jews to this point 
And this was the particular decree that actually began the countdown of the 490 years to the coming of the Messiah. The king of Persia also gave Nehemiah a commission to return and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Actually, remember it was going to be six weeks and then 42 weeks, or is it um, seven weeks and 42 weeks? That's right. Uh, no? I think it was right the first time. Because you, uh, you end up with 49 weeks total, and uh, 6 and 42 gives you 48. I think that's, that's where we're at. Well, actually, I think it comes out differently than that, doesn't it? Because it's, it's 70 weeks. Okay. But anyway, the, the idea is that part, a part of it, I think it was a six-week period, was going to be for the rebuilding of the walls. And here we see the king of Persia give Nehemiah the commission to do that. Again, another king of Persia helping uh, the Jews do what it is they need to do in order to honor God. We read in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And I said to the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress which is by the temple, for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because the good hand of my God was on me. So basically, the Lord turned the hearts of these kings to help his people when they were helpless. And he did this in the face of the attacks of their enemies, the Samaritans. God is the one who is in control. He is the one who turns the hearts of the kings whichever way he wills, even when it looks like there's no possibility of help. Why would you think that the overthrow of Babylon and the bringing in of the Persian Empire would help God's people at all? I don't think the Jews would have seen it that way. But you never know what's going to happen. We do know, though, that God has a plan. And God was going to work that plan out. And so he rules and he overrules the hearts and wills of kings in order to bring about his plan. Now the Lord... Uh, as the Lord had originally brought his people and settled them into the land of promise under Joshua, so he brings them again into the land to reestablish them to prepare for the coming of his son. Now the temple that was being built was ready to be filled again with God's glory, as the Lord said he would. And let me read for you then one of the prophecies given in Haggai chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. One of the things that Haggai the prophet prophesied in order to encourage the people of God to build this temple. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Je Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem to you like nothing in comparison? Take courage, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Take courage also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land. Take courage, declares the Lord, and work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. As for the promise which I made you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is abiding in your midst. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all the nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. You know, I think that this prophecy was fulfilled perhaps twofold because this temple that they built was nothing in, in comparison to its former glory. Yet, when the Lord Jesus Christ came, it had become larger. And the reason it did was because Herod had actually added to it. If you look at a comparison of, of a scale between the two, it's like this small building compared to this rather huge edifice. And I think it was built perhaps out of that temple that was rebuilt by the, the Jews at the return. Well, the Lord said he was going to bring the wealth of the nations and he was going to bring it into this temple. 
But we know that there was something else that he was pointing to as well. And that is when the Lord Jesus Christ himself came into the temple and filled it with his glory. We read in Malachi 3.1, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The Lord Jesus Christ would come into the temple, as we read in, um, already in John chapter 2, and how he cleansed the temple of the house. He says, Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. It is written, it will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And the Lord Jesus Christ, as a matter of fact, made the temple a house of prayer for all the nations. When that temple was destroyed, he built another one. And that temple is the one that is made up, as I've said before, of living stones. So what we see here, of course, is the Lord continuing to do his work in the face of what looks like insurmountable obstacles. His people have been taken out of the land. They've been in captivity for 70 years. They don't have the resources or the right to do these things. And yet the kings of Persia grant to them these generous decrees to go back into the land and to rebuild the temple, and that's exactly what they do. I think we should be encouraged by these things that whatever the Lord has planned, He will do it no matter what stands in His way. Babylon stood against Him, uh, the city of man, but it didn't prevail. God divided their languages and scattered them throughout the earth. The Lord humbled the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, which we didn't go through because we're not spending, you know, we're not going as, as it were through all the details here, but when he made Nebuchadnezzar insane for a while and humbled him. And then he takes the kingdom out of his son and gives it over to the, that is Nebuchadnezzar's son, and gives it to the kings of Persia in order that the kings of Persia might actually promote his work. We would have thought that the kings of Persia would have stood in their way, but they didn't because the Lord turned their hearts to become his servants and they actually serve the Lord. God has the power to do that. No one can stop what God intends to do. The world may stand in the church's way, the world may threaten to destroy her, but she will not succeed because God says that the gates of hell would not prevail against her. God said the world would not swallow up uh, his kingdom, but rather his kingdom would eventually fill the whole earth someday. This work moves forward and it will continue to move forward because Jesus Christ is on the throne and he rules over all things. He controls what is most important in each man's life and that is their hearts. The heart of the king is in the Lord's hands and he turns it whatever way he wills. What we see happening in our nation now is really a part of his plan. Every decision of our government is actually a part of that plan. That doesn't mean that what they're doing is right because actually our government does a lot of evil things, but it does remind us that the Lord will use even their ungodly decisions to promote the work of his kingdom. And even though it may seem sometimes that the kingdom of darkness is, has the upper hand and that it's going to swallow the church, it never does really have the upper hand. The Lord is fully in control and He will bring about what He intends to do. Now if we just simply apply that to all the situations that we have to face in life, I, I hope you see that we really have no reason ever to worry or to be afraid. God is going to do precisely what He intends to do. That doesn't mean, of course, that we don't pray and that we don't seek to change things. We do. But we need to be encouraged that even though things seem like they're going against us, God is in control. Don't let the things that you see dissuade you or make you afraid. Sometimes when we see the world going the other direction, sometimes when we see all the atheism and, and all the evolutionary thought and things like that, and we see that there are so many people who have that kind of opinion, it tends to make us want to abandon Christ and go after the world. I don't know why it does that. Well, I guess I do, I know why. I do know why. There's no uh, compelling reason, but rather it's because we lose trust in the Lord. There's no truth to evolution. It didn't happen. Okay? What the world says is absolutely false, but it tends to give an advantage to our flesh, to our sin, 
to believe those things. That's why I believe, for instance, the uh, Jewish Christian audience that the author to the Hebrews was speaking of that were uh, tempted to run away from Christ and go back to Rome because they were afraid that Rome was going to kill them for their faith in Christ. He says this, He himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we may confidently say, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to fear that things are outside of God's control or that something's going to happen to us that isn't good. Because the Lord has promised that He will work all things together for good for us. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? The Lord will do exactly what He says He's going to do. And so if you are a believer this morning and you are afraid of the way that the world is going, learn to trust in the fact that God is sovereign and that He is faithful and that He will do all His holy will shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly. But are you not a believer this morning and afraid of uh, not only of what might happen to you in this world, but also in that world which is to come? Then you need to put your trust in the Lord to save you because He's the only one who can take away your fear. Actually, He is your adversary until you do trust in Him. Things are not going well for you unless you trust in the Lord. God is against you. You are His enemy. And as long as you remain an enemy, you have every reason to be afraid of Him. But if you want to be without fear, then you have to be reconciled to the one you should be most afraid of, and that is God. And if you will simply take hold of the Lord Jesus Christ, whom He freely offers to you, He will reconcile you to Himself. He will remove that fear of judgment, and He will also take away the fears that you have to face in this life. You have then no reason to be afraid any longer because now you know there is one who would care about you, who is in control, and who will not let anything happen to you which he will not also work together for your good. So the answer to our fears, again, in this, uh, in this life is simply to trust. We need to believe that God is not only able to um, rule and overrule all things for his glory, but that He is willing to do that for us if we will simply trust Him to do so. Well, let's spend a few moments in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us to believe this and to apply it. And then in, in light of that also to um, be willing to do what He calls us to do in the promotion of His kingdom. Because I'm afraid uh, the reason why we don't do more than we do is because we are afraid of people. We are afraid of what the world will think. We're afraid of what people are going to do to us. But we don't need to be afraid because God is the one who is in control, not man. So let's learn to trust Him. Let's pray.